Okay, so today we, our target is to do the first half of the cash flow diagrams. Actually, this is a, a bit uh, advanced lesson. Uh, I must say, like, you know, it will take around two weeks to complete, or maybe three weeks to complete this particular section of your syllabus. So today we will start the first half. Probably in the next week, we will, we will be able to complete this. And at the end of the this particular section, actually you have covered almost 90% of the course content and we have another one more uh, session or one more section to be completed and later we can move on to some uh, uh, theoretical parts that we can complete the module before the exam. So we will uh, go through the cash flow diagrams. So first of all, we should know what is a cash flow diagram. A cash flow diagram is a graphical representation of the cash flows. Graphical representation of the gas flows, cash flows in the sense, it includes the cash inflows as well as the cash outflows. So whatever the cash into the uh, construction and whatever the cash out from the construction with respect to a time scale is generally referred as cash flow diagram. So when we talk about the economics in common, cash flow or cash inflow in the sense, whatever the cash which, which has been gained by the company and whatever the cash that has been spent by the company is cash outflow. So we are drawing this cash flow diagrams. We are graphically representing these cash flows with respect to a time scale. So it simply means our x-axis will be a time scale. It can be either months, either years, either days, whatever it is. And the cash flows are generally indicated by the vertical arrow. So the vertical arrow in the into this time scale simply represent the cash flows. So if it is a cash outflow, it will be represented by vertically downward arrow. Where if it is a cash inflow, it is represented by vertically upward arrow. So cash outflow represented vertically downward, cash inflow represented vertically upward. So you can see here a sample cash flow diagram. So if you look into this cash flow di diagram, If you look into this cash flow diagram, you can see the cash inflows are vertically upward, cash outflows are vertically downward. So in the x-axis, you can see a time scale. In this scenario, it is given in years. So end of the first year, end of the second year, likewise. So in this particular diagram, you can see at the start, there was a cash outflow of 100,000. So it, it may be spent, spent for the... Uh, raw materials or whatever it is. So some spend of money, a cash outflow of 100,000. Then after three years, they have gained a return of 35,000. So after three years, there's a cash inflow of 35,000. Again, at the end of the fourth year, there's another cash outflow of 15,000. And end of the sixth year, a gain of 8,000. End of seventh year, a spend of 25,000, a cash flow uh, outflow of 25,000. And at the end of 10 years, there's a cash inflow of 45,000. So this is a simple representation of these cash flow diagrams. So you can see in these cash flow diagrams, all of these cash inflows and outflows are represented at an end of a particular year. We normally do not represent these cash inflows or outflows at the mid of a year. We basically represent them at the end of a particular year, year or month or whatever the time scale, at the end of that time, not in between two times. It is very important point to be noted 
because when you are drawing cash flow diagrams also, you need to be very careful to draw these cash inflows and outflows at the end of a particular time scale. It can be either in years, either in months or whatever it is, whatever the time scale that you are asked to, you need to make sure that these cash inflows and outflows are represented at the end of that particular period. So in the cash flow diagram, number of interest periods is shown in the time scale. So we call that number of interest periods. So this each time scale is an interest period. The interest period may be a quarter, maybe a month, or maybe a year. So you can see in this cash flow diagram, it is yearly. That means the interest period is year in years. So in some cash flow diagrams, it might, might be quarters, quarter in the sense, a quarter of the year, or else in monthly, that means the time scale will be in months. Since the cash flows generally occur at different time intervals within an interest period, for ease of calculation, all the cash flows are assumed to occur at the end of an interest period. That's what I said earlier as well. Actually, in practical scenario, these cash flows can be happen in between, like in different time intervals. It can be in the mid of the year, it can be in the mid of a month or whatever it is. But for make it easy to calculate, all the cash flows are assumed to be occurred at the end of an interest period. Because we can't like simply calculate these cash flows as per the monetary value of the cash flow because we need to get the net present value. I hope you remember whenever we are dealing with monetary values, we need to measure those values with respect to the time. So interest is a payment that a borrower pays a lender. So if you lend money from some lender, you need to pay an interest. So that interest is a payment that a borrower pays a lender to compensate for the risk associated with lending money. So whatever the risks associated with the lending money, the borrower should pay an interest for the lender. This risk is not paying back. So there's a risk where the borrower will not pay back the lended money. That is what we call as defaulting. That is what basically in, in the current situation where Sri Lanka has become default, what they say as default is Sri Lanka is not able to pay back whatever the money that they have uh, lent. So that says, a defaulting condition where the risk is not paying back the lended money. So the compensate for loss of purchasing power due to inflation should also be addressed. So a compensation should be there for loss of purchasing power due to the inflation. Okay, so 
we have something called as inflation. We have talked about this inflation before as well. Inflation is a situation of rising the prices in the economy. That is the simplest definition of inflation or in other terms. Whatever the money that we have today will not be the same amount in tomorrow. A more exact definition of inflation is a sustained increase in the general price level in an economy. Inflation means an increase in the cost of living as the price of goods and services are rising. So in simplest term, inflation means an increase in the cost of living as the price of goods and price of services are rising. So that is what basically happens in the country at the moment as well. The cost of living is increasing as the price of the goods and the services are increasing. The rate of inflation measures the annual percentage change in the general price level. That means if you buy a particular product in the start of a particular year, and if you buy the same product at the end of that particular year, the change of that particular value of the product is what we call as the rate of inflation. It measures in an annual percentage of change in the general price level. So inflation leads to a decline in the value of money. So inflation means that your money won't buy as much today as you could yesterday. Your money won't buy as much you can buy today as you could buy yesterday. So whatever the amount of goods or services that you bought yesterday from for a particular amount of money will not be sufficient to buy the same product or the same amount of products and services tomorrow that is what simply inflation is If the price of goods rise, the same amount of money will purchase a smaller quantity of goods. That is what simply happens. If the price of the goods are rising or if the price of the services are rising, the same amount of money will be enough to purchase a smaller quantity of goods. So the types of interests that we have, we have basically two types of interests, simple interest and compound interest. Simple interest in the sense, it is very basic thing, which is not actually used in the current uh, situation or in, in the in, uh, present day of world. So simple interest is, in, the interest is earned, whatever the interest earned is linearly proportional to the initial investment. So number of years and the interest rate. So whatever the interest you gain is linearly proportional to the initial investment if you are calculating the simple interest. But when we are calculating the compound interest, which is the most common method of calculating the interest rates are compound interest. That is the interest earned is reinvested into the initial investment. 
and used in the calculation of future interest payments. So whatever the interest earned is reinvested into the initial investment and used to calculate the future interest payments. That is the common way of calculating the interest rates even in your bank accounts. So in the simple interest, when the total interest earned or the total interest charged is linearly proportional to the initial amount of the loan, the interest rate and the number of interest periods for which the principal or the loan is committed, the interest and the interest rate are said to be simple. In that case, as I said earlier, the simple interest is not used frequently in modern commercial practice.
Okay, moving forward to the next slide. To calculate the simple interest, we can use this formula, the interest equals to the P into N into I, where the P is the principal amount lent or borrowed or whatever the loan amount that you have gained, multiplied by the N, that is the number of interest periods, so the number of years that you have promised to pay it back, and I is representing the interest rate per interest period. That means interest rate per year or maybe per month or whatever is the interest period. So total interest that you need to pay back is equal to the amount that you loan or lend multiplied by the N value, the interest period, number of interest period and the interest rate per interest period. So with this formula, let's try to do this example in class. The total amount paid at the end of N interest period is P plus I. P is the lended amount plus the I is the interest that paid. Thus, if $1,000 were loaned for three years at a simple interest rate of 10% per year, the interest earned would be so this is just a simple calculation just to practice the, uh, uh, the previous formula. Can you please do it quickly and put your answers in the chat so we can move forward with the answers that you have gained.
Okay, we have our answer from Nilaksha. It's three hundred dollars. Let's see. Simply add in the given information into the formula. You can easily get the answer of three hundred dollars. That means the total amount owed at the end of three years would be thousand dollars plus the interest to be paid. That is three hundred. Therefore, one thousand three hundred dollars. Notice that cumulative amount of interest owed is a linear function of time. So if the time increases, the number of years increases. So you will have to pay higher number of amount linear to the number of years. So in the compound interest, whenever the interest charge for any interest period, for an example, for year, it is based on the remaining principal amount or the remaining loan amount plus any accumulated interest charges up to the beginning of the period. So the interest is said to be compound. The effect of compounding of interest can be seen in the table for $1,000 loan for three periods at an interest of 10% compounded each year. So you can see in this table, the $1,000 lended or $1,000 lended for a period of three years. So after the first year, $100 interest should be paid. Therefore, at the end of the first year, it will be $1,100. So after the end of second year, 10% of 1,100 is 110, so it will be added, then it will it become 1,210. Likewise, the interest is compounded, not linear to the time. So you can see if you compare the compound interest and the simple interest in a graph for the same scenario, the simple interest, according to the simple interest, the amount owed is lesser than the amount owed according to the compound interest. It will be same for the first year, but from second year onward, the simple interest will be lower than the compound interest. So the concept of equivalence, there's something called as the concept of equivalence. We have already discussed this at well. The value of money change over the time comparing the options or the alternatives must be done at the same point in time. That is why we basically get the net present value. Alternatives that may vary in time, costs and interest, or maybe discount rate, need to be compared from a common reference point. That is what we call it as the present value or whatever the future value of one reference point. So when building the cash flow diagrams, we need to make sure a cash flow diagram allows us to graphically depict the timing of the cash flow as well as their nature as either inflows or outflows. So in a cash flow diagram, we know the x-axis or the horizontal axis is representing the time interval. It may be in years, it may be in months or quarters. In such a diagram, it is very easy to construct. We are starting with simple horizontal timeline. Then we add arrows to represent the cash inflows and cash outflows. So to represent the cash outflows, we need to draw a vertically downward arrow. To represent the cash inflow, we need to use a vertically upward arrow. So before moving forward, can you try to do this example? This is regarding the cash flow diagrams, very simple one. So just follow these three these steps. First, to draw a horizontal line which represents the timeline. Then add the arrows representing the in cash inflows and cash outflows. If it is a cash outflow, it should be towards downward. If it is a cash inflow, it should be towards upward. If you can draw it and take a small snap of the whatever the 
diagram that you have drawn and put it in the chat so I can check it as well since we have only few students in the class.
any answers? No answers. Why the students are moving out? I show the answer. So first of all, you need to identify the given information like this. The number of years or the period is five years. The initial loan amount is $10,000. And the F value, that is the future value. Not, not the future, actually, the, the but what it says is end of year five, the value is 2000. The future value is 2000. And it, uh, annually, it will gain 5310 as a cash inflow and 3000 as cash outflow. So as per the given information, you can simply draw it like this. So initially, the cash outflow is 10,000. That is the initial investment. Then we have cash inflow of 5,000, 
310 and a cash outflow of 3000 per each year so for each year it will be there and at the end of the fifth year you will still have the cash outflow of 3000 and cash inflow of 5310 apart from that you will have a future value of two thousand dollars so this is the simple representation of the cash flow diagram for the given scenario So how to relate this present and future equivalent values for single cash flows? In order to relate the present and future equivalent values for the single cash flows, the cash flow diagram involving a present single sum of capital P and a future single sum of capital F separated by n number of period with an interest rate of simple i per period to identify the future value when the present value is given we can use this formula that is if an amount of p dollars is invested at a point in time and i percent is the interest but it, that can be a profit or a growth rate per period the amount will grow to a future amount of P plus PI. That means P into 1 plus I by the end of the first period. So if you consider the second period at the end of the two periods, the amount will grow like P into 1 plus I into 1 plus I. That means P into 1 plus I to the power of 2. Similarly, for third period, at the end of third period, it, it will become P into 1 plus I to the power of 3. So if it is n number of period, it should be p into 1 plus i into the power of n. So the quantity 1 plus i into the n in this equation is commonly called as the single payment compound amount factor. So if you ask what is the single payment compound amount factor, that is the quantity of 1 plus i into the power of n in the equation of identifying the future value when the present value is given. In cash flow diagrams, calculation of this 1 plus i to the power of n use the functional symbol of, so we can simply represent the same equation in a functional representation of functional symbols like this. So this basically represent the same equation. So there can be some instances where the, this equation is given, not this one. So you should be able to identify this equation or this formula is representing this one mathematically. So the future value is equal to P into FOP. FOP in the sense, this is a simple representation, how we symbolize it for a period of N with an interest rate of I. So if we move to an example, can you try to do this example with respect to the compound interest? Sorry, with respect to the equivalence of future value for present value. Suppose that you borrow $8,000 now, promising to repay the loan plus the accumulated interest in four years for an interest rate of 10% per year. How much would you repay at the end of the four years. Can you try to do it and put your answers in the chat?
is there any other function for you today now only one student is there lakshan is only here in the class If you have got any answer, please put it in the chat so we can discuss. I'm waiting for your answers.
Here we have few answers. Two different answers actually. Let's see. In the question, what they ask is, suppose that you borrow $8,000 now and promising to pay, repay the loan principal of the amount that you lended plus the accumulated interest in four years. That means the in number of period, time period is four years and the interest rate is 10%. So you need to use this equation, F is equal to P into one plus I to the power of N. So once you use that equation or else you can simply calculate it using the table, but it may take some time. So for the first year, let's say the lended amount is 8,000. I into that value, the interest rate into that P value because for the first year, if you use it for the equation P into one plus I into N, the N becomes zero, right? For the first year, or at the end of the first year, I mean, at the start of the first year, N is equal to zero. So at that point, you have 800, so P into I. Then at the end of the first year, that means from the start of the second year, you will have 8,800. So 8,800 into I, one plus I, because this is a compound interest calculation, we should get the compound interest, not the simple interest. So likewise, if you do the calculation at the end of the period, you will get the F value of 11,730. So if you simply get this value from the equation, you can simply calculate it. The landed amount is 8,000 into one plus the interest rate is 10%, that is 0 0.1 to the power of the number of period is four years. So to, to the power of four. So you will simply get the answer of 11,713. So I think one student got the answer correct and the other one did not. I hope now he understand what happens with his calculations. If not, you can let me know. Either you can use the simple compound interest calculation method and do the calculation or else you can simply use this equation and get the answer directly. But the case is, it, since in this question, we have only four years period of repaying time. If we have multiple years, let's, let's say 10 or 20 years, in that case, uh, I mean, constructing a table like this and getting the answer might not be practical. So in that scenario, it's easier to get the answer from the equation. Moving forward. So the same thing using this equation in the form in, in this particular formula, if you remember the formula says F is equal to P into F over P comma the interest rate comma the N. So simply what this bracket says is one plus I into the power of N. So if you calculate one plus I into the power of N for this particular scenario, you will get 1.4641. So that means if you multiply the lended amount by 1.4641 for this equation, this example, you will simply get the answer of 11,713. Okay, now if to calculate the P value or the present value when the future value is given. So for that, we need to just adjust our equation. The previous scenario, it was F is equal to P into one plus I to the power of N. So if I make P as the subject now, the present value as the subject, it becomes F into one over one plus I, or in other terms, F into, or F divided by one plus I to the power of N. So it simply says F into one plus I to the power of negative N. So the quantity one plus I to the power of negative N is we call it as single payment present worth factor. In the previous scenario, 
1 plus i to the power of n, we call it as single payment compound amount factor. In here, 1 plus i to the power of negative n is single payment present worth factor. So we can formula, we can use the other formula as well. It's simply p equal to f into p over f now, not f over p here, p over f, comma, the interest rate, comma, the capital N. So can you try to do this example using this equation? Now we don't need to go through the table. We can directly use the equation. An investor has an option to purchase a tract of land that will be worth $10,000 in six years. In the value of the land increases at 8% each year. How much should the investor be willing to pay now for this property? Can you do it and put your answers in the chat? We have received two answers from two students, which is the same answer, like slightly same. So one answer is rounded off for the first digit and the other one with decimal points. Let's see the answers of other two as well.
give my show the answer. If you use this method, this formula, you might need to identify what is this P of F into P of F comma 8% comma 6 years because the payback period is 6 years and the interest rate is 8%. So this is simply equal to 1 over 1 plus I to the power of N or in other terms, 1 plus I to the power of negative N. So 1 plus 0 0.08 to the power of negative 6 that is equal to 0 0.6302. So you can simply multiply this by $10,000. So you will get the answer of $6,302 as the present value for the future value of $10,000 in six years. Any questions up to this point? So we learned several equations as the base of the cash flow diagrams. So any questions, any clarifications that you need to make? Okay. So there are three rules, three basic rules on cash flow diagrams. So we will stop with these three rules for today and we will discuss the rest of the lesson on these cash flow diagrams, some advanced concepts in the next class. So for the time being, the main three rules of these cash flow diagrams are the rule A is cash flows cannot be added or cash flows cannot be subtracted unless they occur at the same point in time. Either we should convert into the equivalence value of a particular period or else we can't do addition or subtraction of cash flows if they are not happened in the same point of time. That is rule number A. Rule B is to move a cash flow forward in time. That means a percent value to match it with the future value. To move cash flow forward in time by one time unit. So what it means by one time unit is if you want to move a present value for the future value of after one year. So after one year to move cash flow forward in one time Multiply the magnitude of the cash flow by one plus I. That is what we do in the equation as well, where the I is the interest rate that reflects the time value of the money. Rule C is to move cash flow backward in time by one time unit, divide the magnitude of the cash flow by one plus I, the exact opposite thing of the moving forward. So these three are the main rules of drawing cash flow diagrams or dealing with these cash flow diagrams. I hope it is clear for you so far what we learned and what we have discussed regarding the basics of cash flow diagrams. With these basics, we can move forward for the advanced concepts of cash flow diagrams in the next lesson. Thank you for your cooperation, guys. I hope for the next class, at least we will have a better participation rate. Please ask your to, friends to participate to the lectures, otherwise they will not be able to get these concepts clearly. Have a nice day. Thank you.